The Survivalist Podcast with Mark Puhale and Matt Gould. In each episode of The Survivalist Podcast, we look at different events and catastrophes that could happen in different areas of the world. Then we give you the knowledge, resources, and recommendations you need to survive. We'll explore scenarios from a worldwide financial collapse to a coordinated terrorist attack to a global climate catastrophe and everything in between. The Survivalist Podcast is brought to you by Survival Cash, Ford Survival Supply, and TheBugOutRace.com. Please visit our website, TheSurvivalistPodcast.com, for more information or to give us feedback. And now, the Survivalist Podcast with Mark Puhale and Matt Gould. Welcome to the Survivalist Podcast. This is episode 11. I'm Matt Gould. I'm a TV producer. I've made some survival shows, but in general, I'm an intermediate survivalist at best. But I believe I have the right questions, and I'm here with Doc Montana, who's a nationally known expert survivalist. Hello, Doc. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you doing? I'm great, and today we're talking about winter survival, even though here in New York City it's 70 degrees, and what's it like out there in Montana? Oh, I think we're just in the mid-60s right now. Crystal clear blue sky, white peaks in the distance, but I know that won't last. I know, it's just heavenly, and uh, it's my favorite, really, my favorite time of year when the temperature is like this, but I know that it could turn in an instant. New York City is definitely known for harsh winters. I don't know if they can compare to Montana. But so tell me about your uh, background in winter and cold weather survival and and how you got your expertise. Well, I I grew up obviously in winter athletics and winter sports. I did an awful lot of skiing, was director of a ski school, ended up training ski patrol and ski instructors, ran a race program. Literally, I was on the mountain regardless of the weather all winter long. Um, You know, we'd, we'd finally shut down lifts at about 25 below simply because we couldn't evac folks folks fast enough if there was a problem but in general it was living and working in the mountains and then for fun we'd go winter camping we'd ski into national parks in the middle of winter and camp we'd end up uh you know climbing in the winter it was just a a whole different experience and if you do it right it's a lot of fun but your margin of error is pretty slim so one of the first things i want to talk about what i think differentiates our podcast from from others when we talk about winter survival, at least just to define it, what I'm what I'm talking about is something that could cause you to have to endure a long stretch in cold weather conditions without heating system, without infrastructure. So I'm not talking about, you know, how you should prepare for a day hike or how to prepare for camping. I'm talking about different sort of catastrophic events that could force you to really have to, you know, face life or death in the cold weather. So... It, it, uh, what what kind of things could cause that to happen, Doc? Well, obviously, anytime we're living in a place that's pretty cold, we're relying on resources, electricity, gas, uh, firewood, etc. And as long as we have those, and there's a steady supply, and the um, the ability to consume them is is fine. You know, we roll along just great, but. Uh, obviously, there are fragile systems. Gas and electricity are two that often go out during during um, storms. Um, and in fact, sometimes the gas is just fine, but the electricity that, that monitors it or serves it um, goes out. So we end up kind of relying on either old school ways, which could be fires, um, or just what we've got in terms of our personal insulation. Things that can cause that, obviously any kind of heavy storm can knock things out. Normally, you know, it's, it, and it begins with power lines. Um, but of course, there are plenty of uh, natural disasters that can also do it. Believe it or not, flooding is one of them. Um, hmm. If you remember the flooding in North Dakota, fires, floods, and, uh, and then it would freeze because it was happening as the rivers were um, freezing or backing up because of ice jams. Um, obviously, uh, if you live in a volcanic area, um, kind of a double-edged sword, um, if, if something erupts there, it may melt the glaciers, and then you're in flood season, and then you're in winter. Um, and then uh, yeah. earthquakes are a big one, and that's probably one of the more common ones as well as, as um, kind of man-made ones. Obviously, war, civil unrest can cause problems, and some of the simple problems can get worse as they – matriculate into the year and you end up, you know, with what was a mild disturbance in the summer. Well, it's now getting cold and we do see that around the world, um, especially in the Middle East. 
or I mean, I, I always tend towards the more cinematic catastrophes, like um, a gigantic volcanic eruption. Like I, I've read a lot about the summer of 18, 1816 when there was no summer because of a, a volcanic eruption in Indonesia that that effectively blotted out the sun for a whole year. Or uh, I think about nuclear war, I guess. A nuclear war, a nuclear bomb goes off that could have the same kind of effect, right? Oh, terribly, terribly true. Um, and those are, uh, you know, very real things that we do have documentation that not only have they happened, they could easily happen, and we know some of the effects. Um, I guess I, in this podcast, I'm assuming there's a there's sunshine somewhere at the end, but if you got into a true nuclear winter situation, then you might end up with just kind of riding as long as you can, and then <laughs> then it's over. Yeah, yeah, that's cheery. Uh, but yes, yeah, very true. So, all right, so one of the things that we talk about a lot in 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 the podcast, I feel like that Mark Puhali, who couldn't be with us today, talks about a lot is uh, five things you need. Right? It's shelter, water, food, fire, security. Is that what? What do you call those five things? Uh, they can be they're, they're like uh, initially they come down from uh, you know like Maslow's hierarchy of needs if you want the academic origin of them but they're the things that will probably kill you the fastest if you ignore them That's right and them. and so in 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 regular weather in warm weather or comfortable weather what what are the what is the order of those things well it, you look at the duration I mean if you're in in deep and you've got to save yourself and it's going to be days. Um, but it's not cold out, you're probably going to be looking at water um, as the number one. Unless you're cold um, or you've got to treat that water, fire can move back just a little bit. Food, you've probably got a few days before it's going to really start affecting your your judgment, etc. If, if security is, is um, at the forefront, you've got an immediate threat, nothing trumps that. And that's because obviously there's no reason to, to drink or stay warm or anything else, you know, if you're bleeding to death on the ground. Um, and that can be both defending yourself and avoiding conflict. Um, I'm assuming in winter survival that unless something, you know, pretty spooky's happened, you're probably not being chased. Um, there's probably no immediate threat. I can around here, I could see a bear or something which can cause you to divert if you're just out walking around. But um, the the security should be a pretty quick one to solve. Um, in normal weather, you know, if you're, you're going to be a few days, shelter is something you start working on as well as being able to have a fire. Food's down the road, water's immediate. Um, right. That changes in cold weather, though. Yeah, so what what happens in cold weather? Let's talk not just uncomfortable weather, but literally cold weather. The clock is ticking rapidly. Uh, you know, if you want to throw out a scenario, we can yeah. deal with that. All right, so define we'll define cold weather as 10 degrees Fahrenheit, which would be minus, probably, what, minus 7 or 8 Celsius, and, um, <clears throat> you know, snow on the ground, windy, uh, blizzard type conditions okay the the clock is ticking really fast and if you are let's say we start out unprepared you're driving along the highway or something you know middle of nowhere in a in a storm you probably shouldn't be out in you go sliding off the road down an embankment and you're sitting there in your car you're in your you know t-shirt or whatever because it was comfortable in the car um, car stops cold starts to set in 10 degrees um, you know you've got an hour maybe in the car before you're going to be chattering you're going to be too cold so you've got to figure out exactly what the situation is are you rescuing yourself are you going to sit there and wait um, what's in the car and you start taking an inventory because as you get colder your not only does your judgment start to get a little weird um, but your motor skill decreases um, your endurance decreases, and you become um, uh, less able to deal with immediate situations. Um, you know, even operating, if your hands are, are starting to get really numb, any any operation of fine motor skill stuff, like starting a fire with a, a um, you know, a fire steel or something like that, even matches, may be out of the question. Um, and so what you're going to have to do is right. figure out very quickly 
Uh, what do you got to work with and what are the immediate things? Maybe you need to hike back up to the road and, and hopefully flag down somebody. Maybe you're injured and or can't get out of the car. Or you're you know buried in snow. What do you have to work with? And so that's where uh, an immediate inventory of everything you can get access in the car is important. Um, and you immediately start like closing off those loose ends of where you're you're losing heat. Um, obviously, you know, you hear that old adage about, you know, if your feet are cold, put on a hat. Um, you heard that, I assume, right? Yes. Okay, well, I heard that. that you lose, you know, people used to say when I was in the Boy Scouts that you lose 90% of your heat through your head. But then later, other people said that that was not the case. So I don't really yeah, know. I, don't, I wouldn't guess it's, it all depends on a lot of variables. But what I would, the way I like to have people look at it is your body is a machine, and it's got critical components and it's got expendable components. The, the expendables, the immediate expendables, are your ears, your fingers, and your toes. You will survive just fine without those. From then, it goes to your feet and your hands. You know, people lose those. That's part of life. You know, if you're out, you know, mountaineering in the winter, that happens. And yes. then it moves up. It starts working towards the core with your legs and your arms. If your core gets cold, you're in deep doo-doo. If your head gets cold, you're dead. So what's happening is you've got to maintain the heat in the places that will keep you alive, which is your head and your core. And you do that sometimes at the expense of the extremities. But you can't walk if your feet aren't working and you can't manipulate things if your hands aren't working. So that means you have to take your core, which is your chest area, your thoracic area, and your um, abdomen out of the question along with your head. So then whatever is left over from heating those can go out to the extremities. So immediately, you know, you've got to get your head covered with anything. Right. Hat, you know, you should be traveling with a hat, but literally anything to stop the loss of heat. Even earplugs make a difference. I mean, you've got holes in your head that feed directly into the core that are just dumping heat. So you can plug those holes um, and then get your head and neck uh, covered because those are, are very vulnerable areas. The, the um, concept behind a vest is a strict core heating and vests are great because they can allow you to work without sweating too much whereas if you covered your arms um, you might keep in too much heat and what's a vest any core covering it can be from shoving newspaper up under your shirt to putting on all of your t-shirts to putting on um, uh, any kind of a blanket or any wrap around to keep the core heat you know, yeah. then you can start moving down out to the arms. But you, a lot of people immediately go towards, my hands are cold, so they put on gloves. And as long as their head's still uncovered, those gloves are useless. They'd be and off. again, yeah, I know that you're, well, tell me a little bit about the physics or the chemistry involved or the thermodynamics. Because I've often wondered, and it maybe sounds like a stupid question, but when you put a coat on, why does that keep you warm? Is that just because your body temperature is 98.6 and then it keeps that from going out? Okay, well, let's jump to the science for a moment. There are five major ways that heat is transferred, or you could think of it as lost, because if it's cold outside, you're the heat, and the heat's going away from you. And that's radiation, conduction, convection, evaporation, and respiration. And everything we do to stay warm or comfortable in the cold deals with one of those five things. Um, radiation is simply your, your body is warmer than the environment. So therefore, you are radiating heat out. Um, one thing I like to, to point out that's related to both radiation and conduction is when, when Apple came out with their first uh, aluminum uh, computers, laptops, yes. people thought they were overheating because they were so hot. What they were doing is they were radiating the heat from the inside, which actually meant they were cooler because they were dumping the heat out. If the other computers that were wrapped in, you know, say plastic, um, were insulating the, the motherboard, et cetera, so the heat stayed in. So if you feel something and it's warm, you're dumping heat. It doesn't mean you're warm. It means you're losing heat out of that area. So... Um, in radiation. Oh, yeah, that's fascinating. So it's actually yeah. good design on Apple's part. 
then. Yeah, very good, except, you know, obviously we're not used to, you know, having 110 degrees of aluminum sitting on our lap. You know, when you get to conduction, that's the physical touch that can be standing. You know, a lot of times you'll see people move their feet up and down. Their, their feet are getting cold because they're in direct contact with a colder environment or handling something. You know, touching anything metal, you can just lose a lot of heat. Convection is the movement of air. You know, when you're hot and you, like, grab the center of your shirt and shake it back and forth, you know, to kind of pump air through your, your, your shirt or your clothes... Yeah. That's that's convection. You're dump you're heating air, you're pumping it out so it it dissipates, then you're bringing more air in and you're pumping it out. That's why we use fans and open windows um in the car when we're driving. Basically, there's a a bubble of warm air around you. And convection is the motion of that air. And if you increase the motion, then you lose more heat from the body that's emitting that. A lot of times we want it when we're hot. You want the breeze. You want the the coolness of the um, you know the car window versus you know standing still. And then another one is evaporation, and that deals with uh, uh, moisture on the skin. And this is a big one, um, and combined with convection, which is where we get wind chill. You've probably heard of the wind chill factor. Of course, yeah. You know, you put on gloves and hat and, and everything else, the wind chill is gone. Your car is unaffected by wind chill. Wind chill is a calculation based on the moisture content of average skin and convection. And convection is moving air. So the higher the convection rate, the more wind, the more loss of heat or the faster loss of heat, which is also the same as a perceived drop in temperature. So if it's perfectly still, um, at, uh, say, 10 degrees, you add a little bit of wind, and all of a sudden you're at four below, you know, equivalent temperature. Right. But if you were but covered up in a full suit that had a face covering and everything, you... That negates it all. It doesn't negates matter. Negates it. Yep. I see. And but it would have to be left. airtight. Um, or it can even just a coat. I mean, it doesn't have to be... You're, basically, you're cutting the speed of the wind almost to zero. And the wind chill factor, you really have to get up to some high speeds before, you know, 20 miles an hour and stuff before you really start getting some big, big differences. The last one's respiration, and that's your body. You know, your lungs are pretty big. You're taking in cold air, you're moisturizing it, and you're exhaling it. So you're basically heating the world, you know, by by breathing out. And so you might want to try to figure out ways to remediate that. But that's a small player in all of this. And it's one that you're kind of stuck with. Right. That's, that that means being a mammal or being a, right? <laughs> being, yep. uh-huh. That's exactly. what that is. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Warm-blooded. You know, people will pull their, you know, their face down into their shirt or into their coat. Well, yeah, now you aren't, you've negated the breathing in cold air, but now you're putting moisture into the inside of your clothes, and that increases the conduction because water or anything that's wet transfers heat much faster than something that's dry, you know, like clothes, like cloth. So you can make right. things work. You know. Anyway, so that's the science. That's, that's, that's amazing. Working. I mean, I, I, love, I, love, I love that. I love that you know all that. It's great. So, so how do we use this to our advantage, I guess? So we'll go back to our scenario, I guess. So maybe the scenario is you were in a car. Like you said, you broke down. You do have some gear with you. Uh, but you're, you know, the way this storm's coming in, you have no way you're going to get back to society for several days, you think, and you don't think there's anyone that's going to find you. Okay. So, well, it, it, using that scenario, my first question would be, is it day or night? Um, if this happened at night, you're going to want to wait till day, hopefully, before, you know, you're wandering, unless you know exactly where you are um, and and can can find your path at night. A lot right. of people walk off cliffs and, you know, get stuck in tree wells and fall in rivers and other things. But if you, let's say it's daytime, you know, 10 o'clock in the morning, you know, you're not going to be found is, is your assumption. You know, maybe you took a shortcut and that has happened. You know, people or the GPS is wrong or something. Yeah. You're or, or you hear about it. I mean, it, I guess the car, well, the reason I wanted it to be a car is because I have a question because I've seen some survivalists say, you know, your car is a great shelter, so don't leave it. Um, 
but let's you know people happen you know it seems like in in washington on the mountain up there mount uh uh-huh. was it olympia or is it in oregon there are always hikers disappearing right I, I feel like that happens every year that's pretty common yeah one of the issue with the car is if you're going to be found yeah stay in it because it's a phenomenal shelter excellent insulation um it's got a uh, good um it, it doesn't conduct heat very well. The seats are, are probably pretty good as far as insulation. You're up uh, off the snow. Um, wind can't get you. I mean, it's it's ideal. It'd be the perfect tent. Well, it is. It's a camper, you know. But if nobody's going to find you, that's that's like what I said. If you were going to, if it's you know daytime and you don't have any food or water, you know, you can use snow for some of the water. That'll help get you by. But literally, your your clock is ticking sitting in the car and waiting if nobody's going to find you is burning up your onboard calories. So maybe you need to go, although you want to take the weather into consideration, if you think it might break in, you know, eight hours, then hang out, you know, or if it's a middle of a blizzard, you know, and you don't know what's going to happen, well, it's probably not going to get worse, but it could get a lot better. So you want to play that game a little bit. And then also what the, what's the terrain? You know, if you just got to climb up the embankment and start hiking down the road, you know, you can do that in, in worse weather as long as you can stay on the road. Um, but if, uh, you know, you're going to be walking through fields, or mountains or something, you know, the, the problem with the weather, you know, is going to be exacerbated as you try to navigate, you know, over logs and, you know, over creeks or whatever. So you've got to be pretty clear as to what you're in for. But there's no point. You want to stay with the car if there's a chance of rescue and hopefully you would have prepared by telling somebody where you're going. Um, I always recommend bringing a, a GPS with you and that's a handheld GPS. Um, and that way, if you can get cell service, you can literally, and you can talk to somebody, you can give them your exact coordinates. And that's when, you know, if you could give them that information, you could dig in. If it's your car, you can stay there. You've made a phone call. I'm at this you know, these coordinates, you know, get me when you can. You yeah. know, you should be golden. But if so you're let's, in the middle of winter, you may not know where you are. I've slid off the road. I have no idea what mile marker, you know, and then they're going to start a search, and it might be, you know, 20 miles of, of searching up and down a road. You know, sometimes they'll use helicopters with infrared, so they, you know, you might be able to be found that way. I know some people are. Yeah. Um, but literally, you, let's assume you're on your own. You know, and yeah. Then, so, then, so, so or we could take it a step farther that you know there's been some kind of uh, societal disruption. You know sure. that you're that this is a scenario that you're just going to have to deal with. That you have a car and you you know I want to get into asking about what you have prepared, but maybe this is a long term thing. You know, just so we can go through all the things that you'll have to do for for real rugged winter survival. So you have a car, you have your everyday carry. I'd like to talk about what's in it. I don't know if you want to talk about that right now and, and sure. what are the things yeah. you're going to do. So we just go back to it's 10 a.m., you know, the, there's a blizzard, <laughs> 10 a.m., you can barely see the sun, and your car's died. Maybe you ran out of the last gas that there is in all of civilization, you know, for all you know, and yeah. and, and now is the or time. Here's one for you. I know people who switched over to their snow tires, took off, headed out into the mountains, and a tire broke off. It wasn't installed properly. And all of a sudden, their car is its um, not only in the ditch because a wheel fell off, but it destroyed the uh, capability to put that wheel back on. So it doesn't matter if you have a spare or anything. Your car's gone. It's dead. It still runs fine. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. You're not going anywhere. And, and that has actually happened. Yeah, I, I can see how that could happen, yeah. So, but okay, so you have this, you're all alone, you have this, you have an everyday carry. What, I guess let's go to that. What, what's in it? Sure. So, what's in your everyday carry? Okay, first of all, your everyday carry uh, or your go bag or your get home bag or whatever you want to call it, um, I'm going to take it beyond the EDC in the traditional sense of, you know, a knife in your pocket and a flashlight and a cell phone stuff, but um, you need it in a backpack, not in a duffel bag or, um, you know, something else, because you may be wearing this EDC or wearing your survival kit for days as you get out. 
So a lot of people find, you know, an old, um, you know, bag they're not using and they fill it with the goodies. Well, you can't carry those very easily. They don't fit well. And if you've ever been in, in snow and ice, your balance is not as good. So if you're swinging around something that weighs, say, 20 pounds, um, it's going to throw you off. And you want to be able to have both your hands available uh, for whatever you're in for. So definitely, first of all, a, a, a literal backpack of some kind, something with two straps that you can wear. Right. Uh, the next thing uh, is a winter sleeping bag. Um, that's not I, – I, I like down bags. Um, down, of course, has a limitation if it gets wet. Um, but you can get more – insulation for the same weight and less size um, so it's it's a big deal however right. um, you can also get insulative um, uh, uh, tubes basically they're like bivy sacks that you can either use on your own with whatever you're wearing or you can you know insert a sleeping bag into it so you could get by with a much less oriented or winter oriented sleeping bag it's like adding more layers to it. So definitely something there. And one of the reasons uh, that I stress that is because there, if you're, you know, if you crash somewhere, there's a chance you're injured. Um, and it might take you a little while to solve this, to get out or to get stabilized or to, to whatever, you know, deal with your injury. And you may have to just, you know, dig in somewhere. And maybe it's outside your car. Maybe your car's on fire. So you grab the bag, you know, and climb into a ditch and, and you're going to spend the next so many hours there kind of preparing for your journey, splinting your leg or, um, you know, letting your head, your concussion kind of come back. Yeah. So, yeah. Or I suppose if you want to make it cinematic, like I like to do, then you could be being chased by someone who's going to try to find your car and, and kill you. See, yeah. That would be another scenario where you got to get away from the car. Yeah. So you've got to have some way to dig in. Um, then I would go, I would always have extra cold weather clothes and think about the outside in. So the first is going to be some weatherproof shell, like a Gore-Tex shell, a parka. Um, not a, it doesn't have to be thickly insulated, but a shell because you're going to put it over whatever else you need. Um, definitely a good solid hat. And I would recommend one that is windproof. Um, I use Windstopper as a, you know, if you want to get into a, a particular feature, um, something that the wind doesn't sail through like a, your old wool hat, um, which is going to help, but not help as much. Um, definitely right. have some good foot footwear. Maybe you're going, you know, to a business meeting or whatever, but have some boots in the car, real live boots, not, uh, um, n not something that you can't um, navigate in snow or over obstacles. Um, right. Yeah. And and talk to me about um, some of these clothes. I, I'm sorry to interrupt, but uh, cotton, uh, specifically cotton and wool. Like so, what I've heard, thinking back to the old days, is wool is good because it still keeps you warm even if it's wet. Whereas cotton, if it gets wet, actually makes you colder. Yeah, cotton. Well, it makes you colder if you think about those five things. Once it's cotton, holds water better than wool does. Um, so. And it stays wet longer. It doesn't get rid of the water. So conduction goes up. So if you're wearing a cotton shirt, great. But, you know, even in the, in the summer, you know, if you're playing a basketball or something and you're soaked, it feels pretty good. Your, coat, your, your cotton is cold or cooling you. Um, so that's why if cotton gets wet, it loses not only its insulation capabilities, but it increases its, its conduction capabilities. Um, so... You definitely don't want to avoid it if that's all you've got, but be smart about it. Um, so that's that's what's up with that. That's why a lot of the synthetics, the um, like uh, polypropylene, poly was the first. Well, polypropylene, very similar. That's designed as an inner layer, and that's basically like plastic. And so the water is not held in it, so you get what's called wicking. So your next layer out, which could be wool, absorbs the water. can't go back into your skin. Your skin produces the water, goes into the polypro. Then the polypro transfers it into the wool. The wool is less affected by it. It doesn't hold the water as well, and it also maintains insulation, even if it's wet. So that's, that's where that comes from. And then you'd have another layer on the outside, say your, your Gore-Tex layer, which then breaks the convection. Um, so you've got the wool as your insulation, which breaks the conduction. You've got the polypro, which breaks 
the uh, evaporation. Um, so you see how those go to go together? Yeah. Yeah, is you polypropylene know? still state of the art? That's what. It, uh... No, it's it's still out there. There are a lot of variations. Polypro had had a couple of problems. One, you threw it in a dryer, you had doll clothes. Another <laughs> was that. Uh, which also meant that it, it shrunk pretty fast around strong heat sources. Um, it held odor. So a lot of folks, you know, discovered that after a few solid wears of it, they, the stuff stunk. Um, there are any of the good um, high-tech polyesters are probably about as functional. Um, Patagonia makes some excellent stuff. They've got their own in-house um, thing called capoline, um, and I really like it. I've had great success, got a lot of it. I actually have, believe it or not, Patagonia polypropylene, which they kind of don't think they've ever made, but they actually did for a while. Worst stuff ever. <laughs> that's um, funny. I, I think I have Patagonia polypropylene too, but that's because I am cheap and I kept this stuff for 15 years. Yeah, exactly. So that's how that, that cycle works. And you can use all sorts of variations. Throw a down vest in there, you know, outside the wool, under the Gore-Tex. And, you know, now you've got a, a tremendous core building layer. Um, you could throw on two turtlenecks, you know, or a, a, like a, I often, when I'm going out, I'll often have a, a, a T-shirt made of um, one of the polyesters, you know, like for running. And that's my base layer. And then I throw a turtleneck on top of it. So I'm sort of already wearing a vest. You know, I've got two layers on my core. And then I, I also like full zips um, or, you know, half zips if I can, because I need to be able to dump uh, heat. You know, you start working hard. You don't want to start sweating. So I need to be able to clear that out. Um, that's why I like pit zips on the Gore-Tex parkas. Um, right. So you want that is a big to... thing that a lot of survi other survivalists I, I read up on preparing for this said was don't sweat, like do not sweat, which seems easier it. said than done. Yeah. You know, but you can also look at the, that's where you have to be kind of aware. You can start sweating and it's okay if it's in the middle of the day and the sun's shining, you know, because you, you will dry out. But if you do get soaked, there's another option. And that's you seal everything in. You know, I, I call that the Circle William. You know, it's the old, you know, military ships would close off everything when uh, there was a threat of a nuclear or chemical attack. You seal up the water inside you. What you've done, you are now a little bit on borrowed time. But you, um, what you want to do is minimize what its effect is. So you, you're trying to cut off the evaporation, and then you have external um, insulation barriers so the conduction doesn't get to the water layer. So you're soaked and you're in trouble, but I'm going to close it off. In sleeping, there was a thing called a vapor barrier. Uh, when they used to be able to get, they were more common, they're pretty awful to sleep in, but they really did add uh, you know, a, a bigger element of survival, and that was basically like a plastic bag you put inside your sleeping bag. And it, it just makes no sense for most folks, except you're going to sweat in there and you're going to be clammy and wet, but it doesn't go anywhere. So it's kind of like a wetsuit concept in scuba diving where you're, you're, you're going to heat the water that's surrounding you. Now you're going to have to deal with it later, but it, you will make it. So right. Sometimes putting the trash bags inside your sleeping bag makes sense but you have to know what the outcome will be and then deal with that so a lot of people are thinking this is really uncomfortable okay try death yeah that's pretty fascinating and tell me about the uh this is a kind of silly question but since you're so up on this you know vests right like down vests you mentioned vests vests that are sleeveless i've never personally owned one because i always think what's the point you might as well have the sleeves but is there is there a, a reason for this for vests yeah there are a couple of reasons um one of them is many times as you bow and this is where you have to go out and do stuff to figure out how your body reacts um but a vest adds a huge variability to everything else you're wearing. So you may have, you've got your turtleneck, you've got your, your pile coat, you know, or pile shell, and you've got your Gore-Tex parka. Okay, 
and then you you can control the zipping on those and the hat on and off and you know ways to try to adjust it well you can add a vest to that and now push it say another 20 degrees just from the vest or you can take off the parka and you're going to lose heat out of your arms but the vest may act as a windbreak for your core so you're wearing the vest on top of your um your pile and so now you've you've got an intermediate level and guess what your armpits can vent so now you can do heavier work while you're wearing a vest but you're you're not going to sweat as much you know and then when you're done you take off the vest put on your shell or you put your shell on over the top of it i mean it's a very versatile thing it's kind of like a hat for your core a hat for your body you know and, and the hat isn't on or off either you can pull it down tight you can slide it up on top of your head um, you can some of them some people carry uh, um, um, headbands just to kind of keep their ears pressed against their head so they can still dump heat while they're working and sometimes I'll use both a headband and a hat and I'll use them either the headband under or the headband over I'll use the headband over to pull my hat closed around my head Sometimes I'll just pull the, the headband down or, and use it as a neck gaiter, and that's enough, and then I can take my hat off. So I'm constantly making these adjustments so I'm not sweating, I'm not too hot, but I'm also comfortable. And right. head, your head is a quick way to dump a lot of heat, but it's also one that you know, you've got to be able to manage. So honestly, you're working back and forth with all these, these possibilities, gloves on, gloves off, multiple-sized gloves, you know, thin-layered gloves and then heavier gloves on top of them or big mittens you know it shouldn't just be all or nothing um, and gloves are another thing you need in your survival kit going back to the EDC yeah I list off a few more things yeah no this is fascinating I, I just to interrupt I, I was thinking somebody said was it it was like Adam Carolla or something but they said you know uh, it, it's never too cold to be outside you can just be un you can just be underprepared or something like yeah. that, right? Exactly. So you should always be able to be out in the winter for like, or if you're in these scenarios, you should be able to be out there without feeling that that stinging cold at all, right? Because you've got the proper gear. Up to a point, and then you just get used to it. Um, Dean Carnazzi's, uh he was the ultra marathon man. I don't know if you ever read that book. Uh, but he did a marathon in Antarctica, and it took a long time before they got clearance to go out and run because the weather was so bad. And he talks about that just eloquently, that, you know, it starts out just horrible. But, you know, after a week or two, you just, you kind of, you just live with it. Um, you're just used to it. It's kind of like getting out of your car into sub-zero, and it's just, it takes your breath away, and it's, you just feel like you're going to die. And you know, but after walking around for a while, you, you know, your body's adapting. Sometimes it's your body has to change. It's like a machine. You've got so much blood on the extremities and, you know, it's kind of like jumping into a, a river or a lake and you're freezing for the first few minutes. And then, you know, hey, this is great. And you spend the afternoon goofing off. Well, your body had to adapt to it. And so your body needs to and your mind needs to, you know, that you just kind of live with it. And right. All right, that's that's awesome. So let's get back to the every your your. Uh, I, yep. We don't want to call it an EDC, right? It's, you're calling it a survival it's kit. Beyond that, I believe, yeah, it's 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 a supplement to the EDC for for cold weather. Um, I think lighting is a big one. Um, flashlights with spare batteries. I recommend in the winter using the CR123 batteries. Um, those are the common ones in Surefire lights, um, or the lithium double A's and the reason is that the traditional alkaline double A's their their juice goes way down when they're cold and think of all of your stuff being cold you're not going to pull it from a warm trunk or something um, another thing food and water uh, because you are going to you know if, if you're going to be going for a while you're going to need some sort of substance to eat um, I recommend simple things that aren't as affected by um, by the cold cliff bars if you had power bars power bars are rock hard you'll break your teeth trying to eat one if it's frozen yeah cliff bars are a lot better um, obviously fruit and things like that anything with water in it may be frozen solid so you you know basically you throw that stuff inside your coat until it melts um, 
you know, because remember, you can also heat up stuff. You can melt water inside your coat, you know, water yeah. bottle full of snow, things like that. Um, if you have water, I recommend that you manage that. Think of it like, you know, your wallet or something. It goes with you inside buildings and it comes back out melted, you know, you know, and then stays with you because it's not going to stay liquid very long if it's really cold. And right. you can't do anything but waste energy trying to cool it. Um, definitely a shovel. Um, and that's a wide scoop shovel, like a, for snow, not a, you know digging yourself out of, out of dirt and rocks. You want something that you can actually move a bunch of snow. And that's, all, that's maybe to dig your car out, but also to build a shelter if you had to. Um, if you try it with just a garden scoop, you know, it's certainly better than nothing, but it's about one-third, one-fourth, maybe one-fifth as efficient. So it's going to take that many more scoops. Uh, pair well, the shovel is a big thing, yeah, that I saw a lot of people talking about. So, But it still has to be compact enough for you to be able to carry it with you, right? Yeah, there's a lot of them available now. Um, I actually use ones that we use in the backcountry for avalanche um, rescue, and that's, you know, they're they're about a foot square. That's enough to move quite a bit of snow. Short handle, usually they extend. Um, and you don't want one of the really curved um, you know, it's like sidewalk cleaning ones. A flat one would be better. Grain scoops are really common. A big aluminum grain scoop yeah. would be excellent if you've got the room. Um, I was going to mention paracord. Uh, here's a use for you to tie you to the car. Uh huh. Because it's in blizzards, people have literally walked, you know, 30 feet away for whatever reason and not been able to find their way back and died. Right. Because, because it, you know, where is it? And they walk yeah. a little bit to the side and now they're disoriented and they walk back and, you know, it, it's kind of scary. A good tip here is to always be aware of the wind. Are you walking into the wind? Because the wind's going to blow hopefully the same direction. So then you'd walk the opposite way back very carefully. But what's better is you're tied to it somehow. Um, and maybe you're going to, you want to explore. You don't know how far from the road you are. You know, so literally you get your, your hundred feet of paracord out. It also gives you a measurement and somebody else could follow it if something happens. Um, it's kind of a taking a nod from, from cave diving, scuba diving. Where you yeah, literally that's also what they do at those bases up in, uh, down in Antarctica or up in the Arctic mm -hmm. Circle, right? Oh, yeah. If you're going to, you always you clip on. Yep. Um, Another is candles. A candle in the car doesn't burn up a whole lot of oxygen. Of course, you always want to have a ventilation source or a ventilation uh, space in a window. Um, but the candle uh, is, is quite nice, does provide some heat. You can actually melt snow over it, you know, if you're, on, you're working with, you know, literally water in spoonfuls. Um, and you can, um, you're providing a little bit of a light source. So at night, if it's, you know, not a blizzard, somebody may be able to see that versus leaving your flashlight on. Although this is one of those few times when an SOS signal on a flashlight, you know, one of those buried features that yeah. causes it to blink a certain way, uh, can be very helpful. If somebody's right. looking for you or if somebody just happens to notice it and say, oh, gee, you know, that's obviously a distress call way out there. What is that? They don't see you, they weren't looking for you, but they can see this little flickering light. And they show up for a long ways, I mean many miles. Yeah, it's true. I read that the human eye is so sensitive that if it was a straight line and a clear night, you could see a candle flame like 100 miles away or something like that. It was a straight yeah, I don't line. I the, 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 the numbers, but I do see them occasionally up on the mountains. I'll see hikers, you know, and they're many miles away, and I can see when they're, you know, shining their light around looking – Looking at things. Um, yeah. Let's see. And then I, I mentioned the GPS, also the, the cell phone um, battery and charger. You should be ready to go on that. Uh, yeah. Because uh, just like the, the um, batteries in your flashlight, cell phone batteries are also sensitive to heat or to cold. And so, you know, if they're freezing, they won't last as long. Um, so you want to be able to have some backup charge um, if you anticipate that something could happen. Yeah. Um, 
And then what about weapons? You know, let, I, I, I'm just, I always push you towards these extreme circumstances, but I'm thinking about end of the world as we know it scenarios. And so I'm thinking you're going to want to be armed. You know, I, I think that's always a good idea. Um, if you're, if you're carrying something metal like a rifle, you're going to have to manage it. You know, it's going to be big. It's, it's sensitive. If you get snow in the barrel, it's cold. Um, so, uh, you know, it's up to you. It kind of comes with your training. A good pistol like a, a Glock 19 would be my favorite. My That's my preferred choice. Works great in cold weather. You know, works great when you break the ice off of it. Um, holds plenty of rounds. Accurate. Good solid. Um, a very good solid piece. In fact, I, I just wrote an article um, working on the second half of it called the Katrina Pistol. And that's probably what I'd have. Katrina Pistol. Katrina pistol, and you can see it at the SHTF blog, um, and that's that's where I'd start. Um, and then, of course, here's a, a another tip: if you're, let's say you, you know, you crash your car or something, and you're wandering down that road in the middle of the night, the idea is to stop another car. I don't care how you do it; drop a tree on the road if you have to, but. The idea behind this is you have chosen them, which gives you a much greater survival chance than if you just wander around and wait for someone else to choose you. Because a lot of the bad guys are opportunistic and predatory. So if you just keep waving at cars, well, no one wants to stop because they're all scared. Guess what? You know, the one that does stop may be the one who, you know, is the bad guy. <laughs> yeah. Or, or none of them will stop and you'll freeze to death. Yeah, but if you force the stop, that puts them at the disadvantage. Hopefully they won't shoot you, but it does give you an idea that there's a, a very good chance this is a solid person. Because right, because more people are solid than, than sketchy. Exactly. But if you just let them choose, that's when it gets a little dangerous. So I, you know, you see in the movies, people are waving at cars as they're driving by. You force the stop however you want um, because then you know you're probably going to have a better outcome oh that's a lot yeah of people are hesitant and they they don't want to bother somebody or they're they're worried that they're going to go too far no i don't that's why i say drop a tree on the road yeah you'll help them chop through it but you've uh, you've got to be the one in control yeah so, and when you're talking about life or death is what we're talking about then yep. then you know niceties have to go out the window unless you want to die for the sake of being polite Exactly, exactly. And if, if things are in turmoil in the world, people are not going to be that quick to stop, especially after that one event that they hear about where, you know, somebody got robbed and they took their car or you know, whatever. They ran out of gas, they waved, somebody stopped, said, I don't have any gas, and then they're lying in a puddle of blood. Yeah, you know, we or we've all seen The Walking Dead. Yep. Oh, yeah. I feel I feel like Doc that we've been talking for a long time and and that we've had some hidden gems that I didn't realize like the very thorough and yet brief description of how you lose heat. So I'm thinking we make this uh, winter survival into a two-parter. Sure. Yeah, we still have to deal with you know homes and and snow caves, shelters. I mean. I know exactly. Well, I'm very interested in shelters, snow caves, how to build a tree, how to source the wood how to set up a security perimeter for your temporary encampment. Um, I Here's think one also, for you. you would ask yeah. about snow blindness. Yeah. That's, a, that's another thing. Um, I always have sunglasses with me. And of course, you know, growing up on the ski slopes, you were always very aware of it, but if you're in trouble and let's say you've got to walk and it's burning bright out, brilliant snow. Um, yeah, you will, you'll get snow blindness. So what do you do? Find like a piece of cardboard or anything and punch two little holes in it and and uh, wrap it around your eyes. And you've just made goggles. You know, however, you can use the paracord to try to string them on. So you're looking through these teeny weeny holes. Yeah. I didn't invent that. The Eskimos did. Huh. But they have huh. little tiny slits in them. They, they used wood, like tree bark. And they would just cut little slits in them and then they'd put it over their face. Ah, that's if, that's a great tip. Those yeah. Are sunglasses when you don't have any and you've got to walk across, you know, glaring snow. 
that that would certainly help. So yeah, so let's break it up into another one. So then um, what we've got is security, security perimeter. Then there's uh, food, you know, which is going to become very critical very soon. And there's nothing to eat usually when there's a blizzard. So you got to figure out. I was reading one article that says you could eat something called. Uh, maybe I'm sure you know this doc, but I think it was something called cambrium. The inside of the tree bark. Yeah, that if you're really, really desperate, you could eat the cambrium. Yeah, if you know, there's there's lots of little things. Totally depends on where you are. Um, but remember that there are two huge issues, and I would go into this more in detail. One is is you are burning calories at a much much faster rate, so all traditional uh, eating is off. And the reason is your your first fighting the cold but second you're in a tremendously inefficient environment so if you think about hiking through snow versus hiking on a flat road you're going to be going three four times slower maybe more which means it's going to take three four times longer to get somewhere which means the caloric expenditure say to go one mile is now three or four times higher Does right that work? yeah like driving through snow, you do not get good mileage driving through a foot of snow. No. You know, compared to driving on the streets. And it's the same thing. So sometimes people are just exhausted after a mile. Well, it's the same as hiking four or five miles. You know, or half a mile now is the same as hiking a 5K. It, you know, if you want yeah. to put it into perspective. So people are dropping dead not very far from their cars. And you're thinking, gosh, you only got six miles in two days? Yeah, that's why. I mean, it's it's really, uh, really slow. And if you're in hip-deep snow, a mile might take you days, if possible. I mean, that's when you start making snowshoes. Yeah, yeah. Well, oh, yeah, snowshoes is another thing we've got to talk about. And then I, I, I'll finish with a, a quote that I read, I think, from Cody London, the uh, guy from yeah. – uh, you know, the famous survivalist. He said there's basically, well, that's Les Stroud, right? Survivor man. But uh, Cody okay. London was the one where he goes out like in shorts and barefoot in the winter. Yeah, and he's, yeah I know he, who he is. Crazy dude. Uh, crazy successful. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but so let's say um, three ways that he said this, which I thought was interesting. Three ways to keep your body warm are calories, fire, and insulation. And huh. You've got to constantly manage those three things, I guess. Yeah, so, want, like, uh, yeah, go ahead, Doc. Oh, well, if you want to turn that to science, you're talking about the fuel on the inside, the fuel on the outside, the fire, you know, the heat source on the inside, the heat source on the outside, and then the insulation is the maintaining it, how you control it. So, you've got everything covered at that point. Yeah, and so if you know, if you want to, basically, in winter survival, freezing to death is probably you're probably going to freeze to death before you starve to death or uh, die of thirst, right? That's I think that's yeah. the concept because. However, you will star or you will die faster, dehydrated and without fuel. So they're all three pretty well related. The the cold is what'll kill you, but how you got to the point of being able to be killed is related to the other two or can be related to the other two. Right. Right. I guess so. I just picture yourself. I have to get, I have to start a fire so that I can warm up so I don't freeze to death. However, by chopping wood to start the fire, I'm burning a tremendous amount of calories and then I get hot and I have to take off my insulation so that I don't sweat. Right. Mm -hmm. So then. Yeah, this is a cascade of failures. Yeah, yeah. So then you get the fire, but you don't have enough wood, and then you heat up a bit, but you uh, don't have any more fires, and you have no insulation, and then you have no food, and then you die. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a perfectly common scenario. Although most people give up on the fire, if they start getting cold, they're they just sit there and they might be alive for a day you know just sitting there doing nothing um it's not not uncommon to find people they're still alive but then they die later i mean they just they were on their way out but literally yeah fire is important hugely important maybe the single biggest thing if it's the right thing 
You know, you wouldn't crash your car and immediately start building a fire because you may want to get out of there while it's still daylight. Or you might realize it's going to take, you know, there was, that's like when we started talking about the desert, somebody's out there, they may be able to start a fire, but can they maintain it so it's actually worth something? But if you get wet, then you got to start a fire, even if it's a short-term one, to dry off so then you can move to the next step. Otherwise, you're not going to get anywhere. You know, so it's 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 taking an inventory of the situation and then trying to figure out the order, the sequence of steps to give you the best shot at surviving. Right, right. It really that's what's really dawning on me, and we'll save the rest for next time. But that it, it, it's a c- constant set of levers, I guess, that you're moving up and down, and exactly. you know, to to and this give is yourself the best you're chance. Alone. <laughs> You start adding more people, and it gets really complex. Yeah, yeah. Well, so I hope that if this type of thing happens to me, I'm on a tropical island somewhere, and I'll worry about the snakes, I guess, at that point. Just just follow the power lines. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, I – it's – you know, one of the things there's a a article or a book that's published every year called uh, Accidents in North American Mountaineering. Um, And – I usually spend a little bit of time looking at that um, and people come up with kind of creative ways to get themselves hurt or killed. Um, but it's surprising. I think the level of capability now has been, has allowed us to get way in over our head faster and farther than we ever would under other conditions. We buy the big four wheel drive truck. We head out into the mountains at 60 miles an hour, you know, with the heat on full blast and something bad happens. Well, there's no way we could have got 30 miles into the mountains on snow before. There's no way that we would have ignored so many other things and gone so unprepared because we simply could not have. You know, we're seeing that where people climb mountains. They go to REI, buy all the latest gear, get up way high, and then um, then they're in trouble. Well, you couldn't do that as easily before. So we're starting to see people get further in or following a GPS, you know, believing it and and doing things that nobody would have done before, but they're doing it now. Yeah. Heading out with, with next to nothing. I see teenagers standing on the side of the road in the winter in shorts and flip flops and a t-shirt freezing because it was fine in the car. Oh yeah. Don't get me started on that. Every boy I don't know what's going on with the youth of America. (laughs) Now I'm a crotchety old man now that I'm saying this, but every boy I ever see wears shorts all winter long. I don't know. I I don't know. That's the thing, I guess. But, you know, I always said I always wanted to live in a place where shorts and a down coat was totally normal. And I do. That's a totally normal thing here. That is Montana. When I think about everyone I've ever known from Montana, that's it. Shorts and... uh, (laughs) <laughs> in a down coat, yeah, because they say, oh, well, we go out hunting in November, and sometimes it's 60 below, but, you know, that doesn't – we wear the shorts, but we put on thick socks then. Yeah, I mean, it's it's all over the place, but that gets you – you know, it, what that is is the temperature ranges and the kinds of activities you do. Um, you know, that's that's a normal thing. It's, yeah, it was pretty cold. Put on the down coat, but I'm not, it's not cold enough. I'm going to get change out of my shorts. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so let's pick this up again. We have to talk about snowshoes, shelters. Let's just start with shelters. Then we have to talk about how to get food in the snow, how to stay dry in the snow. And then I want to talk about certain things you can do to make yourself more comfortable if you're in in it for the long term. You've been listening to The Survivalist Podcast with Mark Puhale and Matt Gould. Brought to you by Survival Cash. Ford Survival Supply and TheBugOutRace.com. Please visit our website, thesurvivalistpodcast.com. This show is produced by Chad Dugatz at The Hangar Studios in New York City. 